If you are a lead gen based business owner and you are looking to handle sales objections better, I'm gonna be going over some of the top sales objections that I've had or are most common in your nature industry or just most common everywhere and really how I handle those objections. Um, and I might be doing two parts of this video because some of these are going to be very elongated responses. Um, so like, comment, and subscribe. And I hope this brings value to you so you can obviously increase your conversions on the phone and try to pull people back into the conversation because you need to have leverage as a salesperson. So you can send this to your sales team or they can use this for yourself if you're taking all the sales calls right now. So number one objection that I think a lot of people get is, you know, how do we know that this is like the right move for us? You know, what results have you gotten? You know, how can we trust you? Um, you know, what guarantee do you have, right? And that's why we use a pitch deck, okay? So when you're taking Zoom calls and you're showing people like your screen, the best way for you to overcome that objection is like kind of dumbing it down for them. So if someone said to me like, hey, listen, like, you know, how do I know this is gonna work, right? And that's probably one of the biggest things was just the trust and credibility, those things two combined. So that's where in your pitch deck, you wanna have something that says like, hey, listen, here are results that we've gotten and I wanna kind of explain each and see if one of these situations relates to your situation. And most of the time it will because that's the whole objection handling process is like, hey, for example, if you're a business owner who's running an e-com store making two, three thousand dollars a month, one of your case studies, you would start off with like, hey, here's a business owner that was making two to three grand a month and like we helped them do X, Y, and Z and now they're here within three months. You wanna be able to relate to their situation. That's why in the beginning, having those discovery questions to allow yourself to qualify that prospect. So in one of my most recent videos, you can go check out my top 16 sales discovery questions to know where the prospect is, to know where to go in the conversation, to know their biggest pain points. And because if they answer a certain question more than others, that's their major pain point. And that's what discovery questions are really for, for you to realize where the prospect is currently lacking, where they're kind of putting a lot more emphasis and energy on so you can answer their objection more, take care of that and really focus on that pain point. Because if you solve that pain point, you get them closer to closing. Okay. So when I think about result driven stuff, I'm always thinking about case studies and implement that into my pitch deck. Okay. It's not always about press. It's not always about your follower count. It's not always about how much money you've spent or whatever the case may be. It's about, hey, listen, here was a homeowner, here was a business owner, here was a, you know, whatever that niche or ideal avatar is for you. Here's this person who was kind of like you, who we took on, who was kind of scared in the beginning, who didn't want to be on video, who like, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm handling all these objections during that sales pitch because maybe some people don't want to be on video. Maybe some people don't want to, you know, con like for example, right? If you're a roofing company, right? And the person's like, well, how do we know our insurance is going to approve this? Well, who's your insurance provider? Because here is Deborah, and Deborah uses that insurance too. And we were able to get her insurance to cover her roof for completely free. So she didn't have to pay any premiums. Like that would be the way that you would handle that sales objection is using a prior case study to fit that current avatar. Okay. The second one is I don't have any money. Okay. That's another big objection um, because people just want to use that to kind of just make you feel like you're charging too much, which by the way, is then leading into the next thing, which is like, Hey, I know that I can find someone else who could do it cheaper. So when they say they have no money, odds are they just have a really big money block. It's not that they have no money. It's that you haven't given them access to actually acquiring the asset or service without giving them an option. So that's where you would then push payment options or, Hey, listen, like I know money's tight. I know things in the economy are going great right now, but like, Hey, could you at least put this amount down right now? or you find out what kind of liquidity they have in the business, right? So that's where you have to know more about the prospect. That's why those sales discovery questions are gonna work very well for you. So for example, if I'm on a call with a Shopify store, right? And they're making $5,000 a month, the person's also working a nine to five right now to make ends meet, but they don't have the two to three grand to really put into those first 30 days of our service. I would say to them, hey, listen, least case scenario, how much could you put down today to move forward with us? You know, um, and I want you to be really, really, you know, um, you know, serious about this. So give me a ballpark of a number that would make you comfortable moving forward right now. If they say 300 to 500 bucks, I would say, listen, I can do that, but would you be okay signing a contract that would make you obligated to the rest of the amount so that we can move forward with, you know, obligations on both parties and have that trust built. That's where you're kind of building that relationship. Like, Hey, listen, like if you're accountable, I'm accountable. I'm willing to give you that access to move forward, but you have to be, you know, obviously, 
you know, respectful of my time and my business model, right? And that's where you can then get them in the contract where you have this X amount of money as a deposit basically. And then you can obviously get the rest of the money X amount of weeks away or maybe 14 days or maybe next week, right? The other thing is, what payment options do you have? Can you split it into three payments? Can you split it into four payments over four weeks? Like what kind of accessibility do you have in the business to do so, right? And that's where I start cracking down the numbers for them because a lot of them are gonna be really hesitant because they have a mental block and a money block. So that's where I go into, hey, listen, like I know this is, sounds like a lot of money right now, but here's the deal, right? Your, you know, this is just a really good example. I use a lot of analogies when I do sales objection videos. So. Hey, listen, you're booking two calls a day and you're making five grand a month. If I book you six calls a day, you're going to make 15 grand a month, correct? Can we both agree on that? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, well, if you were making 15 grand a month, right, and you were spending three grand a month, that's a 5X ROAS. Would you trade three grand right now to make 15? Oh, yeah, of course I would. Well, if you want to make that happen, then I can get you into the program at this price, or you can take this payment plan, or you can put down this deposit. And, you know, you can start seeing leads in as little as seven days before you even make your second payment. So that's how you can handle that objection just to get them into the ecosystem so they can trust you. And you can obviously get that front end buyer, right? And then that leads me to the third piece, which is another money thing, which is like, listen, you know, I was working with somebody else, or I know somebody else who does it cheaper. That's another objection. So with that one, I kind of go down the route of like, listen, like that's the same thing as you saying, hey, I really want a Mercedes, but I'm gonna go buy a Toyota. And let's be honest, like you'd rather be sitting behind a Mercedes than a Toyota, right? Because if you're gonna go for the cheaper product, odds are if it's cheaper, it's not as great, okay? Would you rather, you know, go to the store and buy, you know, bruised fruit or go get fruit that's obviously way more fresher and that you'd be okay eating that's healthier for you and your family? Like, obviously, the answer is going to be that. It's like, no one is going to really get in the way of their own mind telling them like stupid shit. Like, if I said to them, right, too, it's like, okay, would you rather have a brain surgeon do your brain surgery who's done one surgery or one who's done a thousand, right? Like you're telling me right now that you'd rather die or have a chance of dying than have somebody who's, you know, done X, Y, and Z also like skydive. Would you rather have somebody skydive with you who's done one tandem, one who's done a thousand? It's like, obviously if they're fucking not, like they have a little bit of common sense, they're not gonna pick the left option. They're gonna go for the right one. So it's like, you have to bring it back down to like really simple things. Whenever I do sales, I always think about, you know, how do I talk to this person like they're a five-year-old? Like how do I make them realize that what they're choosing is actually so elementary that an elementary schooler is smarter than them? Because if you make them feel dumb enough, they're gonna go to your side because they don't wanna feel that stupid. They're running a business or they're getting X amount of services, right? They don't wanna feel like they're being dumbed down, but you're not telling them that they're dumb. You're using analogies and circumstances that make them feel dumb without saying it because then you're bringing them down to the level of like, hey, listen, like, what you're telling me right now is really fucking stupid and you need to come to this level because that's where you want to be. And that whole competitor thing, it's like, listen, you could pay less, but if you don't get more, you didn't just waste your money, you also wasted your time. And those are two things that we can't really get back once we spend them because not only will you waste 30 days, 60 days, 90 days with a new agency, you're also gonna waste 1500 bucks if that's cheaper than just paying the $3,000 and getting the result faster so you can grow your business. You know, would you rather throw the money away and waste 90 days or pay a little bit more and get your business to where it needs to be in 90 days? That's the other perspective that you have to bring to them because they know they have the money. You just have to give them the access, the payment plans, or you find a local lender or a business funding lender who you can partner with and do a JV with who will allow your, you know, clients to get funding so that they can become a part of your ecosystem without actually being financially obligated to you. They could be financially obligated to a bank or a loan or a credit line or a trade line, whatever the case may be, so that realistically you can avoid chargebacks and refunds because they are getting that other obligation that's obligating them to now you. So now you can kind of reduce chargebacks and refunds by having them obligated to a loan or a bank. So that's the other like really good upside of that. Um, it's kind of just giving them more access to things like that. So finding people in the space who do that kind of funding can help your business grow tremendously. So this is gonna be part one. I'm gonna go into part two of just some more objections, but I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. If you please like, comment, and subscribe down below, and I'll see you guys in part two of sales objection handling. Peace.